as Mark said, uh, this, uh, uh, the topic I'll be talking about today and the next uh, several days this week is uh, perhaps a little different from what you have heard so far because it is mostly really about dynamics as opposed to equilibrium properties. These are all the systems I'll be talking about are all non-equilibrium systems. And they have been uh, referred to uh, recently as uh, active matter or active materials. So I will uh, spend uh, a bit of time today uh, showing you some movies actually to sort of give you some examples what uh, active materials actually are. And as you will see, uh, we, uh, I will give you examples that span many, many different scales. And then uh, I will also probably use the board to so show you some examples of uh, how we actually go about trying to describe them theoretically. Uh, some today and some in the, next few, in the next few lectures. And also how we go about trying to sort of classify them and, uh, uh, and outline some sort of a, a generic way that describe the properties of these systems that span so many different time and, and like scales. And uh, uh, so, the, so this is an example of an active system. I won't really be talking about fish, but that's one of the examples that actually motivated this field at the very beginning, together with the phenomenon of flocking of birds. And uh, sort of the goal of the field essentially is to identify and understand the physical principles that govern the organization of entities or particles or units like the fish that are individually driven or self-driven. They govern the organization of these particles into coordinated motion at large scales. So let me just try to give you a definition, again, a sort of very theoretical, but the definition is better. So again, it's a system of uh, many particles that are interacting with each other and internally driven. So individually, each particle consumes energy, and collectively, they generate some kind of organized motion. And uh, I will show you uh, examples of many different scales. You have examples inside the cell. This is actually an image that Christian showed this morning. And uh, uh, it's like a cytoskeleton of cells, as an example of an active system. Um, a collection of bacteria, the forms of bacterial colony, may be an example of an active system. A collection of cells that form a tissue is another example, or on an even larger scale, schools of fish, flocks of birds, and so on. There are also many examples that have been fabricated in recent years of synthetic systems that are built and designed to mimic uh, some of the functions and capabilities of living systems. And I'll give you some complete example of all those shortly as well. So, a simple example of an active particle is a bacterium. Here, uh, this is actually a movie that shows the dynamics of a bacteria called E. coli, which I'm sure you all have heard of. So the active particle, like a bacteria, converts chemical energy into motion or mechanical forces or mechanical work or supply, and while undergoing through some internal cyclic transformation. So it's always a cycle so that it repeats itself and the bacteria can do it again. Uh, e. coli is an example. It has a body about two to five microns long. It has a tail made of flagella, which is much longer, maybe 10, 15 microns long. And it swims in a very characteristic type of, with a very characteristic type of motion, as you can see here, which is referred to as a running tumble. It travels in a straight line for a while, then it spreads out the tail and changes direction, then it travels in a straight line again, and so on. So it undergoes a series of runs at a constant velocity of about, say, 10 to 15 micro per second. And then it tumbles, the rate at which it makes about one tumble per second. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit more this characteristic dynamics of an active particle like Nikolai, this running tumble type of dynamics, which is actually quite different from something that was mentioned this morning, which is Brownian motion which is what, say, a colloidal particle in a fluid sitting there at thermal equilibrium does, and that was this kind of random motion that I'm sure you've seen in some classes. And although the differences are somewhat subtle, we will see that they are actually uh, very dramatic at a large scale in terms of what is the collective behavior of these systems. So that's one active particle, one bacterium, coli. 
When you put many together, the behavior is actually quite different from the behavior. So the behavior of many is very different from the behavior of one. E con la, this collection of E. coli, when it's well fed on agar with lots of sugar, say, it exhibits what looks like turbulent light motion, which is actually surprising because a single E. coli actually swims as a, the inertia is really negligible because the E. coli is big, the fluid is viscous to E. coli, and so essentially is like completely over their dynamics in a regime in which you don't expect turbulent light flow, yet, as you saw in this movie, which doesn't show very well, but the dynamics of a dense collection of E. coli looks really like turbulence. When you start E. coli, then what happens is that uh, the dense collection, again, can form all kinds of intricate patterns. Uh, this is not a movie, this is just images, but what you see here is uh, bright spots are high density, and you see that the bacteria organizes itself in this kind of uh, pattern. This is an image start, you started by seeding, say, a drop of E. coli in the center of the container, you wait, it grows, and eventually organizes itself in this kind of uh, radial strips, but each strip is made of dots, so this is another type of pattern, and so on. So again, this ability to, uh, of complex organization at a large scale is one of the characteristics of the kind of uh, systems I'll be talking about, and we like to understand how to model this kind of behavior. At the opposite uh, scale, uh, the example that really motivated back in 1995 uh, physicists to work on this kind of problems is actually the flocking of birds. These are starlings, uh, very large flocks of starlings, tens of thousands. Uh, these happen to be images taken of starlings flying over the skies of Rome by an Italian group that actually figured out how to analyze digitally these images and actually follow the motion of individual starlings and sort of reverse engineer the type of interactions that are needed in the models that I will show you to describe the flocking, the flocking of birds. So the goal was here to use essential statistical mechanics to describe this kind of organization. And again, this is a collection of starlings that are all the same, that doesn't appear to be any leaders, and yet they're able to organize and move collectively in a type of motion that resembles actually the motion of a very soft piece of material, if you like, easily deformable form and so on. That's another kind of thing we would like to be able to describe. Going back to the smaller scale, you find active processes and active systems inside the cell. I think you've heard a bit already about this. So if you look inside the cell, there is the nucleus, the green and red filaments are uh, biofilaments. Here, red is active, green are microtubules that uh, provide the control, of, for instance, form the actin cone, something called the actin cytoskeleton, that uh, provides uh, a structure, shape, controls the shape of the cell and controls most of its mechanical properties. Um, these biofilaments are actually cross-linked by many, many different small globular pro proteins. And among those, there's a class which are known as motor proteins, such as myosin or kinesin. Now, motor proteins are truly uh, molecular machines that are capable of uh, transforming the chemical energy from uh, uh, the chemical process called in the, uh, which is the hydrolysis of something called adenosine triphosphate, the transform adenosine triphosphate in phosphorus and adenosine triphosphate. And they transform the chemical energy literally into mechanical work. They use the chemical energy to undergo a change of shape. And uh, they are capable of walking along the filament. So here is actually an example. Here is a microtubules. And that's the rendering of a kinesin motor protein, which is a protein that actually specifically binds to microtubules. And you see that the kinesin is walking along the microtubule. And in this case, what he's doing, the function of the kinesin is that it carries a vesicle filled with some chemical. So it carries a cargo. And what is more, one thing the motor proteins do is to transport chemicals from one place of the cell to another. Now, this is a cartoon, of course, this is a movie, but it actually, real kinesin, 
looks scarily similar, similar to, to this, if you actually find an image of a natural kidney, it looks very much like that. It has these uh, feet that are called actually heads, that specifically bind to microtubules, and uh, furthermore, a given amount of protein, the microtubules or the actin themselves are what we call polar filaments, that is, they have a head and a tail, let's say. Uh, instead of, sort of like the stick, this happens to be thinner here and fatter here, so it has, I can, I can, I can uh, attach to it a head and a tail. Uh, similarly, these filaments generally, for instance, have, have, they tend to polymerize at one end and depolymerize at the other, and so the, you can actually think of them as oriented filaments. The proteins, a particular protein such as kinase, specifically binds to microtubules and always walks, kinase always walks towards the head of microtubules. There are other proteins that always work towards the tail, and so on. So they're very specific, and this is one of the functions. But in addition, these proteins can actually form clusters. So imagine you had a cluster of, say, two kinases. Then this cluster can actually cross-link two microtubules, just like Christian was describing a minute ago. But these are what we call active cross-linkers, because each more, each protein of the cluster now walks on the two microtubules, and so if I have a, a cross-linking of two both kinases, so to say the nail is the plus end, the polar end of my microtubules, I have a kinase cluster that cross-links them, by walking onto the microtubule, they can displace them relative to each other. So this network of acting polymers, say, or, or microtubules, cross-linked by water proteins, are actually active networks that are being continuously, continuously remodeled by the motor proteins. And those are capable of responding to mechanical forces you may apply from the outside in an active way by adjusting both their structure and the strength of the cross-linking, say, to the type of forces you perturb them with. Um, so, the motor filament complex is itself an active particles, and people have been spending a lot of time extracting this, these ingredients. Of course, the cell itself is a very complicated object, but you can try to extract minimal ingredients, such as make a suspensions with only actin and myosin, or only microtubule and kinase, and try to reproduce in vitro some of the behavior of real living systems, such as spontaneous motion and, and so on. And I wanted to give you an example here, which is um, something called a, a motility assay. So what is this? Uh, what the experimentalists have done is the following. So act, one of these uh, biofilaments that compose the cytoskeleton is actin, and the motor protein that specifically binds to actin is called myosin. So what they've done is that they've taken a glass plate, they have attached a dense collection of myosins, they have tied them down to the glass plate with the part of the myosin that binds to actin sticking up. Then they pour over the top a suspension containing actin filaments and ATP, the fuel these motor proteins use to, uh, to generate motion. So now what you have is this actin filament resting on a bed of myosins. The, bios the myosin are, are tied, but they bind to actin and they kick it, and so they generate motion of the actin filament in all kinds of directions. And now, a, a relative, so what these images are, these are two movies I will show you in a minute. The orange shows the actin filaments. However, in, this is a low density of actin, this is a high density of actin. So first of all, a low density, what you see is that the actin filaments are being kicked along by these myosin motors, and they sort of travel in all directions. Undergoing a type of motion not too different from the type of motion E. coli was undergoing at low density that we saw before. They, so they're zipping along in all directions, driven by the myosin. At high density, what we're going to see here, in this case, only maybe 1 in 200 of the active filament has been labeled. So now, if you think of the orange, rather than representing individual filaments, as sort of a representation of the density. Strong orange means high density of actin. And what you see is that at high density, these filaments organize themselves in what looks like a flock. 
they sort of behave like, like birds before. You have a flock of actin moving around in, in the system in vivo. And so this flocking behavior here is so clearly on very, very different scales. Uh, this, I think, is like 15 microns, 15, I guess, 15 microns, on very different scales as the flocking of birds, which is on kilometer scales. But what we think is that we can use statistical physics and models to describe, actually, as I'll show you, both this type of behavior in some sort of unified way. Yes? This is high density of filaments. Of filaments, okay. yeah. But now, what is, um, um, if, you have, if you lower the density of the, of the motors, so that um, the spacing between the motors is comparable to the persistence length of the filaments. Yeah. What happens? Well, you know, people have not really done, uh, so generally these experiments are always done with a fairly dense collection okay. of motors. And uh, yes, you, you could ask those questions and then the behavior could be different. But what they're trying to do is to set a really what you could think of as a carpet of motors. Okay. So that every filament experiences really many kicks mm -hmm. over its entire at any time over its entire length. Okay? Now, these filaments are fairly stiff, so they do tend to travel in a directed way and without a lot of bending. But actually, um, some of that, you know, you see how possibly more bending than, than you might even expect, and that actually is due to, the, to this, this activity of the motors. It's true, a low density rise in the behavior. Now, of course, so in some sense, okay, this is not spontaneous motion, but this is, you know, mixing up a few things in dish and obtaining motion. And, of course, you have to maintain the concentration of the fuel, the concentration of ATP for this, this to, to happen, this to, 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 be, to be there. But uh, um, it's kind of a moving towards generating in vitro some of the things that cells and living systems do spontaneously on their own. Now, of course, uh, what one really would like to understand is uh, uh, the onset of motion of the whole cell. So now we have two, uh, two examples of two types of cells that are moving on a substrate. In particular, this one is what's called the keratocyte, is the uh, cell from uh, the skin of a fish, is a trout in particular. Keratocytes have this characteristic fan shape. Here is where the nucleus lies, and this is kind of a flatter region where this uh, cross-linked polymer gel called the actin cytoskeleton lies, and it is this cross-linked polymer gel that plays a crucial role in driving the motion. Keratocytes are among the fastest cells in nature. They, go, they move along at 15 micron per minute. Remember, E. coli was about 15 micron per second, so this is awfully slow on the scale of bacteria, but it's actually pretty fast on the scale of cells. But the more remarkable thing is that, unfortunately, I don't tell the movie, but what people have done is chop off a piece of this lamellipodium, and then, so no nucleus, just a piece of this lamellipodium, and actually, if you prod it, if you give it a little kick with the pipette, the lamellipodium moves on the substrate. So, to a physicist, this is really uh, inspiring because then maybe you can start thinking of this uh, lamellipodium, of the material that makes it, this uh, active cross link network of actin, as uh, a material that has the ability of spontaneously moving. So motion becomes a material property of your system, so something that the physicist might be able to describe. And finally, the last example I wanted to show you is actually uh, that it is really beautiful experiments by a group at uh, NYU, in New York City, New York University. This is a synthetic system. These are colloids in a suspension. The colloids themselves are actually uh, this is a, they are about 600 nanometers in diameter. They have a little uh, hematite, which is a piece of hematite, which is a magnetic material embedded in them. And when you put them in a suspension in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, there is a reaction that is catalyzed by the hematite. So the hematite catalyzes the breaking of hydrogen peroxide in oxygen and water. Anyway, this chemical reaction generates clearly chem chemical concentration and actually in this case also thermal gradients in the region near the particle that actually push the particle to move. 
So each one of these colloids behave as a self-propelled particle. Each one of these colloids swims spontaneously just like E. coli does. They don't eat, but they use the energy from the chemical reaction to swim as, again, as I said, self-propelled particles. Now, there is more. Actually, this reaction does not occur spontaneously. It has to be triggered by light, UV light. So what the experimentalists can do by switching light on and off is to trigger, when the light is off, your colloid is just your dead colloid and will jiggle around like a Brownian particle, as all colloids do. But when the light is on, your colloid becomes a self-propelled particle and moves around like E. coli does, with these runs and not quite tumbles because it doesn't have a tail, but it's a run and the change of direction, which is due to noise. Okay? So let's look at that in this movie where you have only a few colloids, as you can see there. So now the light, I think, is off. You see these brownian particles, dead particles jigging around. And then the light is on. They kind of swim like E. coli. And then I think the light will go off again, and then we'll jiggle around again. Maybe not. Maybe the light stays on. I don't remember. <laughs> Um, similar behavior is also seen in this Janus colloid that Christian mentioned this morning. When you have a colloid and you coat half of it with platinum, and half of it is your plastic bead that you had before, say, again, in a solution with hydrogen peroxide, there is uh, the uh, breakdown of hydrogen peroxide is catalyzed by the platinum, and this causes this particle to become self propelled. The difference is that in that case, you don't have this knob of lights you can use to trigger on and off between the dead behavior and the living behavior of these colloids. Now, when you put many, many of them together, so higher density of colloids, what they do is something quite remarkable. Again, they self-organize. In this case, these little flux. Now, these little flux are really not on clusters, they really are crystalline clusters, right? that's what they are here. By the way, these are 2D. These colloids actually uh, live on the surface of, of the fluid, they go to the surface, so these are 2D clusters. They are not moving around like our birds or our actin, but they still are um, sort of clusters, and the organization in clusters is driven by the activity of the system. You saw that when the light went off, the clusters broke apart. So again, self-organization driven, as we will see, entirely by dynamical processes, essentially. And we'll try to understand this. Okay? So I gave you a bunch of different examples uh, from different scales, different systems. And let's try to kind of stop a minute and ask ourselves to, to highlight what do these systems have in common. What is common to all these systems? Well, first of all, they're all systems out of equilibrium, where you have a collection of, again, I'll call them particles. It could be the colloid, it could be the bird, it could be the actin motor protein complex. Okay? So I'll call all of those particles. You have particles, and the system is driven out of equilibrium by the fact that there is a drive that acts on each particle, often generated internally, like in a bacteria. So this is different from most non-equilibrium systems that we've been studying for a long time, where, say, we drive a fluid out of equilibrium by applying a temperature gradient or by shearing it. We apply a perturbation at the boundaries. Or we take a magnetic system and you apply a magnetic field. So each spin feels precisely the same field pointing in the same direction. Here, you can think of these self-propelled colloids as little beads with an arrow <laughs> attached to them, which is their instantaneous beads. So, but, but the instantaneous, sorry, I should say instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous velocity is different for each one of them. Unlike the drive, a spin fills into a magnetic field, which is the same for all of them. So, Systems that are driven out of equilibrium by something that acts on each unit in a different way. Another property of the epic particles, but not all, is that they are often elongated, they are often rod-like. The bacteria are rod-like, the 
the actin filaments are, are rod-like, the birds, the fish, they are all rod-like. The active colloids are not, though, so this is not a rule that applies to them all, but many of them are. So what they can do, they can actually alter the states with orientational order. I don't know if you have heard about liquid crystals next week, but I know Greg has promised to talk about them tomorrow. But if you have a collection of rods, if you put a lot of pencils on this table, if you put enough pencils on this table, it would be favorable for the pencils. You can fit a lot of pencils, but at some point they will order. They will prefer, <coughs> for entropic reason, to be all on average aligned in the same direction. That's a state with orientational order. The position of your pencils is random, but the orientation is on average the same for all of them. They have a lot longer. OK, so these, these systems can do that too. And then they exhibit dynamic self-assembly, or set of coordinated motion of large scales, in the presence of noise, but without any leaders, without any external magnetic field breaking the symmetry. The symmetry is broken spontaneously in this system. And what we like to do is understand what are the generic universal properties, and maybe we can describe some of these <coughs> processes like flocking as a non-equilibrium phase transition. Um, after all, this is the way we like to think of matter, right? We think of matter with a collection of atoms, and as we tune some parameter, say temperature, we might go, well, usually we think of it, let's, see, let's go the other way, we might go from a gas into a liquid, into a solid. And so, similarly here, we have a collection of particles, and they can organize in various kinds of states. The only difference is that these particles are moving, are individually driven again. Yes? Uh, looking at the movies you presented, so it seems like the, these filamentous bodies can read uh, the, the orientation of the other bodies close to them. Can you explain the mechanism that the beds use to... Uh... Um, so, in some cases, yes, although I, I don't plan, so of course there's, there's a very interesting question here, which is, if I say for something like a bacteria, what is bacteria, what is the mechanism that it uses to switch? Or what is the mechanism that by which this, this thing, these filaments, well, in the case of the filaments, it's not really the filaments, it's the motor proteins that are moving on the filaments, and so by action-reaction, the filament, so if the motor proteins walks this way, the filament will move backward, okay? But I am not going to talk so much about the mechanism by which these particles are driven, but about how the fact that they are driven leads to them organizing in collective states which are new, which are different, that has their usual properties. So maybe we can come back to that later, but for now, just, just bear with me, and I, I, will, I will show you something about that, okay? Um, Okay, so, so that's, that's the plan. The plan is to understand what are the states of these new states of matter and what are their behavior, how we change from one to the other, what, what do we tune instead of temperature to change from one state to, to the other. If you like, for my colloid, you know, at low density you have the gas of active particles undergoing this running tumble type motion, at high density you have these clusters, the crystalline clusters. So here, as we tune the density, we go from a gas state of matter to a sort of crystalline, let's call it, state of matter. So how can we understand that? That's what I really want to talk about. So I will switch off to the board in a minute, but just to give you um, an idea of what I plan uh, to do for the next uh, lectures, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a summary here. So first of all, we're going to be talking about sort of two types of systems. Uh, we can, Im well, okay. Uh, uh, so today, I'll give you a little bit of a very generic introduction. And then I want to next give you some specific examples on how we model these systems. And uh, this is actually over the first two lectures. I plan to tell you about something called the V-check model, which is a model for the flocking transition. And uh, it's continuum version, which is known as the toner tool model, which we can think of it as sort of a field theory of flocking, like we do you know, field theories for phase transitions in equilibrium, we're going to do one here in the non-equilibrium system. And then I'm going to have to show you a very simple model where we can do some simple calculations even on the board of uh, self-propelled particles that can only repel each other 
And this is sort of a model that might have some relevance to the active colloids that I showed you about. And that also exhibits some kind of surprising behavior, such as a spontaneous phase separation, which actually explains possibly the creation of these crystals in the colloid system I showed you before. In the second two lectures, I will actually tell you about essentially the hydrodynamics of active liquid crystals. And this is work that might be relevant, these are models that might be relevant, for instance, to bacterial suspensions um, or to collections of uh, uh, myosin and, uh, and actin or kinase and microtubules in a dish, a suspension of filaments and water processes in a dish. And I will show you that there's a very rich dynamics in that case. And one thing that is really, I like to spend some time on is on, uh, uh, you've heard about topological defects in various types of systems, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more. Uh, the, well, the topological defects in these active liquid crystals that we talked about are actually quite special, and uh, they also exhibit all kinds of uh, novel and interesting behavior. So that's the plan, plan for, the four, uh, for the four lectures. And uh, just in case you're interested in reading more, here are two reviews. The first one is a very short, very simple, very little math in it, just to give you kind of a very quick idea of the field. The second one is actually a pretty long, 50 pages, reviews of modern physics paper, which actually has quite a lot of math in it. <laughs> and so that's if you're interested in, in the really learning things in a little bit more details. Okay. So are there any questions now? I know this is, was all a little vague, but I will try now to make it a little more concrete. Are there any questions now? Otherwise I'll switch to a slightly different mode. Is that the Okay, so let's see if we can get the slide. Actually, it didn't come because I might... Uh, okay. I, I, I might show some pictures still. So. Okay. Okay, so first thing I want to do, as a theorist, I'm a theorist, so one of the goals of theory of physicists, I mean, in particular, is always to try to classify things, right? You try to, if you want to try to make a generic theory, you need to identify classes on the basis of things like symmetry and things like that. So before I actually get to show you some specific models of active systems, I want to kind of very broadly try to classify all these different examples I showed you before, uh, I showed you on the board. So I will classify active systems and active particles on the, on the basis of orientation of them. Or lack thereof, as a matter of fact. So we can think actually, we've seen examples of, I would say, three types of active particles. One is an active particles that are themselves polar. What I mean by that is nothing to do with charge, I just mean where I can identify a head and a tail. So examples here of polar active particles that we have seen could be bacteria, fish, and so on. Okay? And so these are generally elongated, but they have a head and a tail. So, I don't know, maybe I'm drawing like that. So in some sense, they can be described as an error. Okay? And these kind of particles are capable of ordering in states with what I would call ferromagnetic order. So there's generally some interactions, and this may order in a state where on average, all these active particles are aligned in a given direction. So this is a state which has what I would call ferromagnetic order, or sometimes also called polar order. And uh, if I were to describe the state instead of in terms of an order parameter, the order parameter, just like the magnetization of a magnetic system, the order parameter in this case, or P stands for order parameter, the order parameter would be a vector which I will often denote by, actually I will denote today by V, which stands for velocity. The reason being that a state of active particles that are ferromagnetic order, ferromagnetically ordered, is also a state that is on average moving. Okay? Again, that would be the bacteria, or the birds, or the fish. Second type of 
radioactive particle would be one that is upolar. Maybe meaning an active particle that is elongated but does not have a head and a tail. An example, for instance, are certain cells called melanocytes, which are the cells that in your skin shake back and forth to disperse pigment. So this is an active particle that might shake back and forth, I'll indicate it like this, but it's not going anywhere. So when these active particles, which I will now denote just as segments, as lines, I don't bother putting two arrows, but they are active because they, they move through some internally non-equilibrium process, they can also on average order along some direction. But the type of order I obtain is nematic. Because up and down is the same. This type of order will be described by an order parameter which is a tensor, and I guess you have heard about this last week. So it's usually called the alignment tensor. I will call it QIJ, and that's the matic type of order. There is also another type of active particles, like colloids. My colloids are not elongated. So the reader, they cannot order states with orientational order. They're just little spherical beads to which I can attach an arrow indicating that they are instantaneously self-propelled. So these are just spherical. These are my active colloids, as an example. Okay. So this will not order in any state with orientational order, but we have already seen that they do exhibit surprising collective behavior, such as the formation of this uh, so self-organization into these uh, crystalline clusters. Or, as we will see, they also exhibit true phase separation, actually, without any attractive separation, without any attractive interactions. Okay? And, and that's a, that's a kind of very interesting phenomenon. Now, of course, I should add that polar particles can also order in nematic states. Because polar particles can also order in a state where half of them are moving one way and half of them are moving the other way. So actually, a nematic state of polar particles is also possible, and there are actually systems that do that. There's a bacteria called mixobacteria that seem to do precisely this. So it might be a little bit more complicated, but I think it's useful to keep in mind these general classification. So today, I will mostly show you how we might go about describing these kind of systems. And today and probably tomorrow, actually, we'll stick with this kind of, sorry, today we'll stick with these kind of systems. Tomorrow I'll give you an example of these kind of systems. And then probably the last two lectures will be devo devoted to active pneumatic, as we call them, and their topological defects. There's a question. Yeah, any question? Uh, the Polar situation, would that also include particles that acquire polarity by some induction process, or they get induced polarity? Such as? I don't know. <laughs> Say there's something that's symmetric, and because there are other particles rubbing past it, or something like that, it gets a sense of direction from that. That, that could be. That could be. That, I mean, I, I don't have an example like that in my mind, but the one thing I want to point out which I'm to be careful about, is that I mentioned, say, the microtubules before, right? Or actin or microtubules, which we know are polar filaments. So you would think that those would be in this class, okay? And indeed, they are. But people also make bundles of microtubules, where roughly the bundle, the bundle itself, say, half of the filaments are one way, half of the other. The bundle itself is an active particle, which is in this class. So I'm mentioning this to point out that it's actually not so easy. If you look at the system, you don't know for sure. Well, OK, you know, you know if the particles are not spherical, but you don't know for sure where you are here, OK? 
One of the points I hope to be making by the end of my lectures is that one way to tell is by looking at the topological defects. Because topological defects carry with them the fingerprints of the symmetry that has been broken in the other state. And so that's one way actually to tell. So if you tell me a system of theory, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I know, obviously, say a fish, okay, it's polar, it has a head and a tail. But I may not know for sure. But that's one way to be able to tell. Okay, so. Okay, any other questions? From the upper, upper group. Okay, so let's talk about polar systems. So today we're going to talk, be talking about these kind of systems, models for these kind of systems. Now, another approximation that I will make today and tomorrow is that a lot of these systems are, again, a single particle I is a bacteria swimming in a fluid. Okay? So, generally, what happens in those systems, you have something called hydrodynamic interactions. What you have is that each bacteria experiences a mean friction due to the fluid, so the dynamics may be over them as opposed to inertial. But on top of that, if I swim here, I generate a flow, my neighbor might see this flow and actually sees this flow and the resulting interaction will be carried along by the flow I generated. So the resulting interaction is called hydrodynamic interactions. Okay? Today and tomorrow I will neglect these interactions and the only way, the medium in which this particle moves will come into the, the models I will describe will be through friction. Okay? So the dynamics that I will describe will be what we call over depth. What does that mean? You know, when you, when you want to describe the classical dynamics of a particle, you write Newton's law. You write mass time acceleration equal to force. Okay? But when this particle is moving through, the, to a, through a fluid or through something that leads to friction, okay, this is the, say, the external force. You have to add here the friction. So if they take the friction coefficient, of course, these are all vector. This is the frictional force, which is inversely proportional to the velocity. If the friction is large enough, inertia, acceleration, is negligible compared to friction. So I will actually neglect that. And then the equation of motion becomes this one, or actually this one, <laughs> in the truly completely over damped limit. Meaning the equation of motion, instead of being force equal to acceleration, is essentially that the net force is equal to zero. Okay? And the lack of acceleration means that these things cannot undergo, um, you know, the motion is very laminar and very smooth, so there is no sharp, there's no sharp changes with the velocity. So we'll be working in this limit, which is called over there. Well, the equation of motion, I just leave it this way. Okay. So, keeping that in mind, I want to tell you about what was the first model that people wrote down to, to try to describe this plot of behavior, which is known as the Vichet model, which was formulated in 1995 by Tomasz Czech, but it's actually due to a computer scientist called Craig Reynolds who worked for the um, animation industry and in 1987 wrote a paper well, essentially, he proposed what we now call the Vichet model, and he proposed that this model could be used to produce animations, such as the Wilder Beast Stampede in The Lion King. And this model has been used for those things. In fact, Reynolds has won more than one Oscar for his work, but we call this the Vichet model because this is well known to be arrogant, so that's what, that's what they do. Okay. The model is indeed, so remember, this is the systems. In these polar systems, I can really think of my one of my self-propelled particles as sort of a vector, right? A vector, the particle itself, check out of the particle as point particles. He was inspired by bird flocking, but in his model, each bird is a point. 
is a point particle. It's moving in a direction indicated by this arrow with a characteristic velocity, v0, which is fixed. It's the same for every verb. Okay? So each verb becomes an arrow, which is sort of like a spin. So the model was really inspired by models of ferromagnetism. It's actually formulated in two dimensions. So it's really a model of what we could call flying. This is a y. Flying XY spins. Okay? And the model is really very simple. So the idea is that you have uh, N of these point particles. Each one of them is described by an arrow two dimension, which is just a direction, and at any instant of time has a speed v0. So I could actually. This is the direction which I could identify by a unit vector. I call it n of n sub i for the i particle. But the unit vector in two dimensions is also just an angle. So the angle that the arrow makes with the x direction. So I will call it theta sub i. In other words, what I'm saying is that I'm writing the unit vector as cos theta i sine theta i. Okay. And in order, so the particle at some instant of time is at some position that I will call xi of t. This is another vector in two dimension. And the direction of the arrow, the spin, is this angle theta i. So don't confuse my position vector with the spin vector, which is x sub i. Now I need to tell you what are the interactions, but I'm doing dynamics, so what I need to tell you is actually what are the rules that go around the dynamics for the system, okay? And the rules are uh, formulated by which I can really very simple. He said, well, at each time, so I have this spin, which is traveling in some direction, and at each time, each, each particle looks at the neighborhood, uh, of radius r and looks at all the other particles that are contained in this neighborhood and on average, which may be traveling in this direction, and it aligns with that. So to translate that into a rule, I say that the, 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 the angle this particle will make at time t plus delta t is equal to the mean angle of all the particles contained in this circle of radius r plus some noise, actually that's called the noise eta. So at every time step, one of these flying spins looks at all the other spins contained in the radius r, it aligns with them on average, but makes some mistakes with some noise. Okay? And then it moves forward in the new direction, uh, or it moves forward in that direction, at speed v0. So xi plus 1 equal xi of t plus v0 times ai delta t. Actually, I kind of should have shifted. Let's say that it moves forward this direction and then it aligns because my time step are reverse here. Okay? But the impo one important thing is that the motion. The rules is not perfect, there is, there is noise in the system. And this noise is supposed to be like thermal noise that are correlated with some strength that I would call beta. If you take this model and you simulate it on a computer, it does all kinds of interesting things. You can actually define an order parameter for this model, analog again to the magnetization. The order parameter for this model will be the mean velocity. So I will take the instantaneous velocity of all my spins, sum it up, divide by the number of spins, take the magnitude, I will call this V, I'm really just adding up angles here, okay? And then I will say that if V is not zero, I have an ordered system, it's like magnetization being non zero, and when V is zero, I have a disorder system. Now, if you simulate this system on a computer, which is what we checked first did, 
and uh, calculate this other parameter. What you find and plot the as a function of the strength of the noise. So this you could say that this eta is delta correlated in time. Uncorrelated for different spins, uncorrelated in time, with some strength eta. Eta is the strength of the noise. So I plot it as a function of the noise. And I could actually plot V divided by V naught because every particle has the speed V naught, so the maximum speed they can have, the speed is always fixed to V naught. What I find is that uh, for small enough noise, the system is ordered, and then at the characteristic noise, let's call it eta C, so here the system is ordered, here is disordered. So as I tune the noise, I spontaneously go from an order to a disorder state. This is a spontaneously broken system. Symmetry is a non-equilibrium phase transition of a system of flying spins in two dimensions. Okay? You could also get this transition by tuning density. So the system is ordered at low noise or high density and disorder at high noise or low density. And uh, this was considered very interesting because it is known that XY spins in two dimensions in equilibrium can now for, can, they, they don't form an ordered state. This is a theorem of statistical mechanics known as the learning diagram theorem, which says that a system in two dimensions, a system with continuous symmetry, these are spins with continuous symmetry, they're not easing spins that can have only up and down. This can point in any direction. So a system of spins, uh, XY spins in two, in two dimensions in equilibrium can not form an order state. Because fluctuations are too strong, the fluctuations will always destroy the order state. But what happens in this system is that your order parameter really is both an order parameter and a velocity. And this will become clear why this is important when we do the continuum model for this system next time. But this is both an order parameter and velocity. So it's an order parameter that tells you about or orientational order, but these things are also moving. So if very, very, very rapidly, if I have a fluctuation over here, then the fluctuation actually diffuses, moves, because actually literally diffuses. The fluctuation also diffuses and sort of spreads it at, itself out and becomes weaker than it would in equilibrium. And so it's possible to maintain to have order in this system because, because of that. Now, Richard said, did the simulations, and he said, well, this is sort of like the continuous phase transition of a magnetic system. But more recently, people have done larger, bigger, better simulations, especially a group in Paris. And they have uh, concluded that actually this is a, this, uh, seems to be a first order phase transition. Now, what, what's, the, what's the difference between a first order phase transition and a continuous phase transition? Anybody willing to? How do I classify phase transition? So this is the order parameter. That's what I plot here in the infinite system limit. Would you say this is a continuous or a first order phase transition? Well, continue, right? Because I'm drawing an order parameter is going continuously to zero. And in fact, we check images look like this. But more recently, people get plots that look more like this, say. I'm just trying to draw something. So there's this continuous jump of the order parameter at the transition, and these are believed to be first order phase transitions. This is going to be a little strange because next time I will actually start by modeling this as a continuous transition. So it's going to be a little bit possibly confusing. But certainly the numerics seem to indicate this. There's another um, thing that is interesting. Uh, there is one property of, of uh, first order or discontinuous phase transitions, which sort of really distinguishes them from continuous ones. 
which is something called coexistence. So it's different states can coexist, right? Uh, when you draw the Van der Waals curve, and then you uh, you draw the horizontal line that brings you from, say, the, the gas to the liquid or the liquid to the solid, if you move along the horizontal line of constant pressure, that's a region where your gas and liquid can coexist. And that's a signature of first order phase transitions. So what people have found numerically is that in this system, in near phase transitions, actually, you also get coexistence of order and disorder state. And in fact, what you get, now let me see if I can find the image I wanted to show you. Okay, so if you simulate the Vichak model near the phase transition, you don't really find an order, if you go to very, very high density or very, very low noise, you find an order state where everybody is moving in the same direction. But closer to the phase transition, you find this type of behavior. You find what we call traveling bands. So what the blue here are the particles. You cannot see, but each one of these particles carries an arrow. And they organize in bands of high density, strong blue, separated by regions where the system is like a gas, if you like. So the blue band is an ordered region. All the particles are on average traveling in the direction of the red arrow. And uh, the white region is a gas of active particles. The particles are going in all directions. And you can get you know, many bands, many thin bands. You can get, depending on your initial conditions, because these are true simulations. Uh, and, and, and by the way, what, these were simulations carried out actually without noise, where we're only looking at the effect of density. That's why the system depends on the state you get depends on the initial condition. But the other thing is that the region, so why are these bands always aligned with the square? Well, this is because in this case the system was started, well essentially it's because the square geometry of the system really breaks the symmetry. And so if you're simulating a square system, you might have bands traveling this way, you may have bands traveling up or traveling down, but the square geometry breaks the symmetry and leads to these bands being aligned along either one of the axes of the square or actually sometimes one of the diagonals. Okay, so that's spatial. But you could say that these are the flux. These are the flux of the which I've modeled, right? Ordered region in a C or disorder system. Now I will stop in one second. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, how, understand, how exactly uh, or why exactly this, mod, this comes out to be a, a discontinuous phase transition instead of a continuous one is really not understood. It's actually one of the open questions in, in this field. Not surprisingly, because actually we don't really understand first order phase transitions anyway, and so certainly we don't understand the amount of equilibrium. But um, what the thing I want to add about this model is that this model has been actually used with some modification to describe the blocking of birth, the blocking of real birth. If you remember the movie I showed at the beginning, I said that these, these uh, Italian physicists actually have been able to extract from these images the behavior of the various girls and to sort of reverse engineer the type of interaction that were be needed in that system to, to get the behavior they see if they were to describe the dynamics in common models of this type. Now, one interesting result they found is that they were able to do that with one change, one important change. I actually erased here, I said that in the Vichek model, it's each spin interacts with all the spins in a neighborhood of radius R. Well, it seems that starlings, the starling clocking have been described in the Vichek model, provided instead of assuming that each spin interacts with all the, and the spins in the neighborhood, you actually assume that every bird always interacts with the seven closest birds, no matter how far they are. Now, this can make a big difference the low density or if you are near a boundary of the flock. Suppose this was your know, flock is over here, right? If you are high density, you are a bird in the middle, whether you interact with the seven closest or with the ones in the, in the so-called, really doesn't make a big difference. 
But if you want to go right at the boundary, that can actually make a big difference, provides interacting with the closest seven rather than with everybody in a circle makes a big difference because there is nobody here. And so possibly that is the interaction that provides a kind of cohesiveness and robustness to the boundary, provided the surface tension, if you like, that is needed to make this really a flock. Okay. So I just wanted to say this, but next time what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you an interesting model that was put together as a sort of a continuum version of this model, where we can do what we are more familiar with, perhaps, um, to do with a sort of language of phase transition, a sort of Landau type theory, but again, for a system algorithm. So I'll stop here. The number seven for the interaction is simply geometric or? Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely. You know, most likely, first of all, the number seven is for starlings. <laughs> okay? And first of all, not all birds flock, but even for the one flock, one could easily expect that other birds may be characterized by a different number. I don't know what makes the number seven special, and nor, nor do they. Um, that's just what was. Oh, you know, what you obtain if you try to fit the behavior using this kind of models. And I don't think people really understand what, uh, <laughs> so, I don't know. Have there done any models where the interaction becomes less as it goes on? So, I mean, people have done many, many variations on, on these models. Uh, first of all, they included um, short range steric repulsion, which may not be very important for birds because after all they never get close to each other, but it's certainly very important for instance for bacteria. This model has been applied to bacteria. At high density bacteria can get close to each other, so steric repulsion is, is important. Um, I don't know if the people working on starlings have tried models with the interaction is uh, um, you know, less cohesive, less strong, but perhaps because you interact with fewer neighbors. I would expect that, uh, um, so, well, in, actually they did, they tried, so they found that seven was the number that was needed in order for the system to make a clock to hold together. So a uh, smaller number, the, the, the clock would not fall. When you use the original Vichek type interaction with, with the, everybody within a given circle, I mean, you essentially what you are assuming is a short range interaction and you can show that the behavior does not depend on uh, how big the circle is. Although, of course, if the you know, interaction, if the circle were to become macroscopic, then you are in a different category because then it becomes sort of like a long range kind of interaction. So that's, that's different. But. Yes. Um, yeah. So in experimental systems, how would you quantify the noise? Would it be the density of, the, of each individual unit, or say in the light activated colloids case, it would be the intensity of the light that causes the noise? Uh, no, in, uh, so first of all, in, um, you know, in, even a model like this, that we write down referring to individual particles, uh -huh. is coarse grain, right? When you coarse grain, so there are, there are two sources of noise. First of all, when you coarse grain a system, which means you identify some degrees of freedom that are, you know, not truly microscopic, okay? You're always leaving out a certain type of dynamics and the difference can, can come in as noise. So as soon as you say you coarse grain a system, you, you have to have some noise in your system. In addition to that, if you look at the microscopic, uh, sorry, if you look at the experimental system like the active colloids, well, there, is, there are all kinds of sources of noise that could be associated with fluctuations in, uh, um, in the light, fluctuations, in, you know, difference in the size of particles, you know, there's all kinds of sources of noise even at the microscopic level. If you look at the system like the acting cytoskeleton, again, you are leaving out you know, there's a lot of noise there. There are lots of degrees of freedom you're leaving out of your description. Okay. And you can, and you always try to put them in approximately as some kind of noise, which is, so the noise is everything you're leaving out, is everything you know nothing about. 
No is the surprise, you know, ignorance about this system, I guess I would say. Okay, so then you can construct different phase diagrams based on, say, density or light intensity? Yeah, so the density, so this behavior, so there are really only two parameters that you can tune in this model, and they are uh, the noise and the density. The strength of the noise, right? And the density. Okay? And uh, you can get an order state, either a low noise or, high, and, uh, or a high density. So you can, you can tune, you can move from the order to the order state by changing either one, essentially. Okay. Now, the other thing you could ask about the noise is, I'm taking the simplest possible noise, is uncorrelated in time, uncorrelated among the particles. A different type of noise could lead to a completely different behavior. So for instance, I could assume some finer time correlations in the noise then the behavior could be quite different. And I have no good reason for taking a simple noise like this other than that's the simplest one I can make up. Yes, how does this depend on dimensions, say, the three dimensions? So this was all done for the longest time, strictly for dimensions. <laughs> and now people have done also work in three dimensions, especially in medical work, and they see very similar behavior. For instance, they see uh, walls instead of bands traveling in, uh, in the system. And of course, the continuum theory has been done also by the potential because that is you can, so we can always do what they can. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? So, well, I, I'm not quite sure if my question is relevant. So, once we talked about noise in the system, so I was wondering if. There is any chance to have like any internal or external disturbance in the system? So, yes, so, um, first of all, for instance, um, going back again to the birth example, uh, people are certainly interested, you know, you have this huge flock, which is like this, this soft body. Imagine you have a falcon coming in, mm -hmm. right? And what you will see is that this, this, really, this, uh, this flock really deforms as if there was some sharp object <laughs> that is coming in into, into a soft block, right? And, and again, one question you could ask that. So, you know, the time scale over which the flock rearranges and the fall is much faster than, say, the time over which girls can possibly uh, interact with each other. That is, as we've shown, that, you know, the, the, the response of an individual girl. So how can that happen? How can this information travel to the class? And, and people think it's because of essentially, once you have an order system, you really have long range correlations, and, and, and that's what, you, what kind of provides a transmission of your information, although it's not really well understood. So that's, that's an example. But another example, when we're going to talk about systems that are taking trust closer to condensed matter, uh, what are the mechanical properties of an active system like this? What happens if I, so if I have this active, um, actin gels, cross, cross link by motor proteins that make up the cytoskeleton, how does it respond to applied forces? What happens if I share it? Um, these systems actually can generate forces internally. And so, so actually, how they respond to perturbation is a very interesting question. Yes, yeah, so once we have no information about noise and it comes unknown part, right? So then how we distinguish between disturbance and noise and how we identify whether it's a noise or it's a disturbance? Well, so the disturbances I'm talking about are generally macroscopic ones, mm -hmm. meaning the same on every particle. The noise is sort of an internal degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, this noise is like, when you are uh, talk about granular motion, mm -hmm. right, you have a colloid in the fluid. Mm -hmm. So the fluid bombards, or, or in air, bombards with grain of pollen in air, right? The, fluid, the, the air bombards this big grain of pollen all the time. If you want to develop a model for describing the dynamics of the grain of pollen, I mean, you could actually look at the dynamic, at how it's bombarded by the air molecule all the time. But that's very complicated. That's more than you want. So a simple model is to say, OK, what's the effect of the air on this grain of pollen? Well, first of all, there is an average effect, which is friction. Okay. One step beyond all that is to say that everything else is described as noise. And in this case, you would call it thermal noise. And actually, in this case, you can show that in some limit, this thermal noise can be described this way, that are uncorrelated in time, and the strength is indeed proportional to temperature. Mm -hmm. 
So we have learned about thermal noise in equilibrium system, and now we try to mimic it here. But the origin of the noise is always some coarse grain. You don't describe the dynamics of every atom in your system. Some of them you pick out and describe, and the others you describe in some effective way, which you call noise. Now, the external perturbation, like a shear or um, mechanical deformation and so on, those are macroscopic things that you apply from the outside. So they're actually a bit different. Yeah. Uh, is there any minimal radius to neighborhood or maybe a minimal density of, of, of the system after which uh, it creates such a soft matter? Uh, yeah, yeah. So example. this picture that here, if the dolls have drawn it as a function of density. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so actually high density is the order state, so I would have to draw it as a function of 1 over density, okay. say. I'm not saying it looks identical, but <laughs> and then there would be an order state at high density and a disorder state. Okay. That's what I mean when I say that you can tune either of these and get the transition. Okay. Like in equilibrium, you tune the temperature, sure? mm -hmm. or in some systems, actually, you can tune the density and get the transition. Okay. Should, uh, move on okay, we have, yeah, we have a coffee break and we have to yeah. have a sit out break and a Skype call and then she's not going down for screen sharing. So. <laughs> and you're